Okay, so we're up to chapter one. So, um, sorry, it's uh, way in concept. So it's more of a theoretical chapter, chapter one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't think this. Most of the labs in the chapter, I think, are sort of researching uh, WAN, WAN stuff more than anything. So, um, the the parts that we uh, parts of the chapter we talk about are WAN technologies, and so we look uh, look over the different types of uh, uh, WANs and what we use them for, and of course, then we yeah uh, look at those technologies and you uh, and making selections of what would be the best solution for certain uh, situations so the technologies good morning it is morning isn't it yes uh, <laughs> so why would we have a WAN well it's pretty obvious I suppose uh, we need to join multiple sites together over a wide area hence a wide area network so be that, uh, you know, I suppose you could say that it's a wide area network from Tonsley through to, uh, uh, what do they call the other one? Uh, Bedford Park. Um, I'm going to say some, you'd also call that a metropolitan area network, but anyway, um, but of course, you know, if Flinders had an, uh, a campus at, I don't know, Port Lincoln or whatever it might be, that would certainly be a wide area network. And so it's all about geography more than anything. Um, and so, of course, the greater the distances, often the different the tech, different technologies are required. And of course, normally you'll be using the services of a telco. Um, so I suppose between Tonsley and Bedford Park, they, uh, Flinders might have their own uh, fibre cable running. It's not that great a distance, I suppose. Um, but of course, they wouldn't run their own fibre from uh, Bedford Park to uh, Port Lincoln, I wouldn't imagine. Um, and so normally you do need to use the services of a service provider. I suppose there is another trick, I suppose, wireless. Uh, you can do uh, wireless LANs up to about 40 k's distance. Um, but of course, uh, yeah, it's all line of sight and so the curvature of the earth, earth comes into that. Um, and of course, other things can come into it too. Things like trees growing, or someone building a skyscraper between your two sites, or whatever it might be, can affect that greatly. Uh, I've, yeah. So, uh, so of course, when you bring in a service provider, there's going to be a monthly fee, typically, for to use that uh, those services, and uh, and so of course, the providers then give you the links to interconnect your sites for data, voice, and video. Okay. So without WANs, LANs would all be isolated. And so, of course, uh, we certainly don't do that much anymore, having isolated networks. It's only when there's major security issues that you normally have isolated networks these days. And so, of course, that's when we bring in regional and branch offices um, uh, organisation need to share information with other customer organisations and of course employees on the road also like to sort of access the corporate corporate network to get up to date information and the like. Uh, in addition consumers can now commonly communicate over the internet with banks, stores and other providers of goods and say online shopping is only increasing. So what technologies uh, can be employed and so point-to-point uh, -point topology is basically just a single link between two sites through the cloud. And so, of course, what happens inside that cloud is really not our problem as long as it works. Um, and so, of course, that's just a single a link that you've bought. Of course, uh, and so normally if you have a lease line of some description, uh, uh, there's actually sort of different levels of service you can use. The T standards are actually used in the USA and uh, Japan, while the E standards are European standards, and which of course are what we use here in Australia. And so a T1 of course is 1.544 megabits per second. E1 is two megabits per second. 
and then as the numbers go up the the uh, the uh, speed increases um, but yeah, e1 is faster than t1 but from memory t2 was a fair bit faster than e2 so anyway um, <clears throat> And so again, as I said, because it all happens inside the cloud, as long as the data bits that go in and come out are all the same, we really don't care what the telco does in the middle. Um, and so that's why we draw the cloud. It's sort of, it's all quite complex and we really don't need to know. Uh, of course, with the hub and spoke, you know, you normally think of a larger organisation, the hub being the central office or main office or whatever you want to call it. And then the spoke is all the other campuses uh, for the company. And so uh, I'm going to say you could have point-to-point -point links from uh, the main site to all other sites, but that's you know that would often be you know a different physical connection for each site at the main office. While the hub and spoke, you can use uh, your more your smarter uh, setups like frame relay and the like, and so you can have a single single physical link then sharing uh, these virtual circuits across it and so that can save you money and uh, yeah it gives you flexibility um now topologies themselves um uh, basically uh we have uh basically a hub and spoke is is one possible solution and so of course there's your hub your central point and then there's a link to all of your uh, campus uh, sites but there's no redundancy in that and so a full mesh is basically uh, is that you can actually have every site has a direct link to every other site now that's great and so it gives you a lot of redundancy of course the downside is you're paying a lot for that. Uh, and so basically it's all about dollars. Um, and so uh, rarely is a full mesh topology uh, actually uh, done, but what you can do is a partial mesh where you have at least two links going to each site. And so from there, of course, if one link goes down, the other link won't hopefully, and so at least you have some redundancy there and you can actually have traffic being routed across alternate routes and still getting through to the destination. Now dual home topology is basically where you have uh, multiple uh, hardware, so you have hardware redundancy uh, and of course you can do load balancing as well and so you basically have more than one option and so of course Reliability is the major upside there. Uh, quite possibly greater capacity as well. But uh, yeah, and so uh, of course, again, with more reliability, more lengths, more cost. But yeah, you have the, and complexity as well, I suppose. But uh, you, you have the advantage of uh, redundancy. So uh, it's all swings and roundabouts, I suppose. And so evolving networks, and so basically they've got a scenario here of a company called Span Engineering, starts out as a, uh, a small business and then it grows. Uh, and so of course, in slow economic times, many business fo businesses focus on increasing their profitability by improving the efficiency of their existing operations. And so of course, the networking is an ex is an expense to their network and so they try to make that more efficient as well to justify such a large expense many companies expect their networks to perform optimally and be able to deliver in an increasing array of services and applications to support productivity and profitability uh, this chapter will focus on a fictitious company called span engineering and we look at how spans network requirements change as the company grows from small local business into a global enterprise which is, I suppose, what most businesses would like to do. <coughs> and so uh, Span Engineering is an environmental consulting firm, has developed a special process for converting household waste into electricity and is developing a small pilot project for a municipal government in its local area. 
So 15 employees, six of them are engineers and CAD and partners and assistants and all kinds of things like that. Uh, small office uses a single LAN to share information between computers, support their VoIP phones and share peripherals, connects to the internet using DSL. Uh, uses support services purchased from uh, a DSL provider for IT support. So five years later, it has grown rapidly. They have uh, been contracted to design and implement full-size waste conversion facility, as well as other projects in neighbouring municipalities and around the country. And so their small to medium business with several hundred employees, company now occupies multiple floors of an office building. It's grown to several sub networks, which uh, span several floors of the building. Uh, and business now is an in-house IT support staff. Another six years later, uh, been so successful, they expanded their operation have opened small branch offices closer to the project sites. Uh, and so, of course, they've been uh, required to implement a, a WAN between those different sites. Uh, and so all the sites can access their central data uh, stores, basically. The branch offices that are in nearby cities use private dedicated lines through their local service provider. Uh, further away, they use the internet for their WAN connections. So again, the business has been around for 20 years now and has grown to thousands of employees distributed uh, in offices worldwide. The cost of the network and its related services is a significant expense. To increase profitability, the company must reduce its operating expense. What methods has the company used to reduce its costs? And so to meet the new requirements, the network must provide necessary converged service and secure internet WAN connectivity to remote sites. As seen in the example, the network requirements of a company can change dramatically as the company grows over time. So WAN operations and how it relates to the OSI model. So basically, uh, we're talking about the bottom two layers, so the data link layer and physical layers. Um, of course, layer three and up, of course, that's IP and beyond. They're, of course, the end-to-end -end services, and so they're consistent. While the bottom two layers are, you know, on a per-link basis. And so, uh, and so, of course, a physical layer is all about your physical standards, and uh, data link layer, of course, is about your addressing flow control and encapsulation. So WAN standards are defined and managed by a number of uh, organisations, the TIA, EIA, so Telecommunications Industry Association and the Electronic Industries uh, Industries Alliance. Of course, there's the ISO and then there's the IEEE as well. Um, and so, of course, it's those two layers that the standards apply to. Now, as you can see in the diagram there, um, when it comes to layer two, HDLC, which is high level data link control, triple P, which is basically an updated version of HDLC, but more standardised. Then there's Frame Relay, which was the example about that, uh, uh, what were they describing it as? Uh, your, your point to multi-point, basically. Uh, Ethernet WANs are, of course, an option these days. NPLS, which is your multi-protocol uh, uh, labelling uh, system. And there's VSAT, which, of course, is so lot uh, communications, of course, there's other broadband solutions. So of course, physical layer is all about your physical, mechanical and electrical standards. Uh, now, there is some terminology that we uh, need to use. Um, so basically, of course, as, as was said before, Typically, when you have a WAN, you will need to use the services of a uh, external service provider or carrier. And so basically from there, you you have to have what's called a demarcation line. So you can see that dashed line through the middle of the diagram. Um, and so basically that's the border between your network and their network. And so it actually is different. Uh, the Americans do it one way and the European-based mob do it the other way. The Americans basically have the demarcation point at the plug in the wall, while the European 
standard is basically uh, they also provide the DCE device that uh, connects your network to the WAN. And so the demarcation line is a little different between America and the rest of the world. Um, now, customer premises equipment, of course, is the stuff that you own. Um, and so it's your inside wiring and, and, and the like. While the DCE, as I said, that's uh, in the European side of things, that normally comes from the provider. And so that's part of their equipment. Uh, in the US, it's actually your equipment. So it, it depends. And so, yeah. Uh, and so DCE, data communications equipment. I've probably used that term previously with the other term of DTE, if you remember, data terminal equipment. And so DCE, of course, is your layer two device that uh, coordinates the link between your site and the other sites. So data terminal equipment, as I said, so the difference between DCE and DTE, if, I, if you can't remember, is layer three and above devices we normally determine to be DTE. They're actually a source or destination of uh, traffic, while DCE just transmits other people's or other devices uh, 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 traffic. And so as I said, there's the demarcation point or sometimes just called demark. Uh, and so as I said, that's the, that's the line in the sand between your network and their network. Uh, local loop, of course, is the, the uh, run between your site and you know, be that the telephone exchange or their office. Um, sorry. <laughs> it's a guy I work with in town. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so the local loop is the link between, uh, yeah, the central office and your site. Central office, of course, is, you know, the telephone exchange, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and then, of course, then there's their network. They're sometimes called the toll network because, yeah, you pay to use it. Um, now, how do we connect to uh, uh, the uh, network? And so dial-up modems, thankfully, we don't see them often. Anyone remember those things? Hmm? <laughs> Got to admit, the last time I used a dial-up modem, I was very frustrated. When I moved house, I did, took a while to get broadband, and so I was using dial-up. And yeah, we ended up going. We end, well, this is ten years ago. Uh, we did end up going to Macca's and having a coffee and uh, using their Wi-Fi uh, while we were waiting. Um, yeah, bit slow, um, and so they used the old the old legacy telephone network. You'd have trouble using them these days. Uh, you know, if you've got NBN in your house, it's basically not an option. Um, um, and even if you don't have NBN at your place, you'd probably have trouble anyway, because I don't know how many ISPs still have banks of modems. Um, <laughs> so an access server is a legacy technology where the server controls and coordinates dial-up modems, dial-in and dial-out user communications. Cisco actually used to sell devices that could have you know, 16 or 32 modems plugged into them, and that was all... Yeah, so there were a router with extra points that you could plug the modems into. Um, so, of course, these days, most of us have probably got a broadband modem, especially if we're in a uh, fibre to the node solution. And so, basically, we're using DSL. Um, it's just it's a, normally VDSL, I think, which is you know, a very high-speed one. Um, and so, yes, we still use a modem. Of course, modulator, demodulator, if you have uh, know, know what that means, basically it just converts digital signals to analog and vice versa, depending on whether it's sending or receiving. Um, so they work in a similar way, just of course broadband modems can deal with a lot more data at a, at a time. Now CSU, DSU is basically uh, much the same as a DCE. It's a specialised piece of equipment that basically converts your data frames from your network into something that 
the uh, WAN can use. Um, and so, of course, we have routers, which, of, uh, of course, will be at your place typically. And then there's the core router that the uh, service provider will use, or depending on whether we're talking about them or where we're talking about a big business. Um, now, there's uh, several ways you can connect to uh, connect two sites together, and one is to have a circuit switch network. And so basically, I suppose most people think of the old modems. And so basically you dial through, it negotiates a connection through the, uh, the network, as you can see by that orange line going through the diagram. Um, and so that's set up before you actually connect. Um, and then, then communication can work while uh, the connection is up. And then when you stop communicating, you will normally turn it off because you're normally told by the amount of connection time. And so you're trying to minimize that. Um, so um, so uh, the two major solutions for that are PSTN, which is your public uh, switch telephone network, or there was the newer version that was supposed to replace it, ISDN, which is the Integrated Services Digital Network. Um, but really, it, ISDN was never really an affordable solution, and so not, that, not all that many people used it. It was good for some small businesses, I suppose, because you had two separate circuits. So you could have uh, maybe a fax on one link or a, and a telephone on the other. Of course, these days, I suppose, the, who uses a fax these days? But a lot of people use, the, you know, your... FPOS, so that would probably be your second one these days. But yeah, everything goes internet these days. Uh, so circuit switch, as you can see, there's the dialing, the setup phase, then you use it, and then you tear it down afterwards because you're normally told by connection time. Australia was a little bit different with telephone, of course, because you didn't normally get charged by the minute, but that was local calls only. Now packet switching is basically you have this connection up 24-7 and uh, you would actually have virtual circuits for all your links. So uh, basically, uh, instead of a connection, connect to the network, then use it, then disconnect, you would be continuously connected to the network. And so normally you would be charged by the bandwidth that you get from that. And so you would negotiate a, a bandwidth uh, for that. And so, uh, so uh, sometimes it could be connectionless. And so I suppose it's much like IP over the network. It's just there and you hope for the best. And there were other connection oriented packet switching networks. And so I've already mentioned Frame Relay. Um, I think Frame Relay is on its way to extinction, but it had certainly had some advantages to it. And so uh, DELCES, which is data link uh, control. Um, oh God, it's been so long I've spoke, since I've spoken about it. I can't remember what the I stands for, but basically DELCES were the, uh, the addressing system on frame relay. And so packet switching costs less than circuit switching. However, latency and jitter are gra uh, greater in packet switch networks. Okay, so how do we select WAN technologies for our needs? And so basically they've drawn up a tree for all your options available. And so they've split it into private and public. So public, of course, is over the internet. Um, private is either your uh, dedicated lines or your packet or circuit switched connections. Uh, when it comes to public, of course, internet's the option. If you want some security, that's when you might do a VPN, a virtual private network. And so, of course, the hardware used uh, is, well, and, and the solution used is either DSL, cable, wireless. Um, of course, there are other options as well. Um, when it comes to private, a delicate, dedicated lease line is an option. Um, so security is not an issue there because no one else puts their traffic on your network. Um, but of course, the downside of a lease line is the cost. You've paid for that circuit to be permanently there for yours 24-7. And so, um, yes, there's expense there. If you need it, great. If you don't need it, yeah, 
not many people do it. And so that's where you get your service uh, levels by, you know, T1s and E1s and so on and so forth. Uh, now, then when it comes to switch network, circuit switched, as we said, we've already pretty much spoken about that. So you've got the public switch telephone network or your ISDN. Um, and then packet switched, there's a whole pile of solutions there. So Metro, Metro Ethernet, which is basically what um, the NBN is these days, especially if you've got fibre to the home. Um, and then there's MPLS, frame relay, ATM. <coughs> Have we heard of ATM before? As uh, asynchronous transfer mode. It's actually normally used inside the telco networks and they don't call them frames or packets. They actually call them cells. And so very fast, they have uh, ASICs built for that, so apl application-specific integrated circuits. And so they switch very quickly. The major downside for ATM, it works really well for voice and other things like that. But for data, uh, the cells are actually only 48 bytes worth of payload per cell. So, you'd, so your IP packets are actually going to end up being chopped up. And because uh, there's also a five bytes worth of header information, and so the sort of the ratio uh, header to uh, payload is actually a fair bit higher in ATM. So it was developed before data was really a very big thing. And so it's probably not an ideal solution for it. But anyway. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're, the, they're your major options. Okay, so uh, service provider network infrastructure. So service provider networks are complex and consist mostly of high bandwidth fiber optic media using either SoNet or synchronous data hierarchy. Uh, a newer fiber optic media development for long range communications is called uh, dense wavelength division multiplexing. And so that's basically multiplexing is of course is combining multiple uh, transmission connections or whatever you want to call it together. Um, and so multiplies them in a bandwidth that a single strand of fibre can support, enables bi-directional communications over one strand of fibre, can multiplex more than 80 different channels together in a single fibre, and so they can do 10 gigabits per second multiplexed. So lease lines. So when permanent dedicated connections are required, a point-to-point -point link is used to provide a pre-established WAN communications path for the customer and premises to provide uh, to the provider network. Point-to-point -point lines are usually leased from a service provider or called lease lines. However, since they have been around since the 1950s, they've also been called lease circuits, serial links, serial lines, point-to-point -point links, and of course the service standards of T1, T3, whatever it might be. Lease lines vary in price depending on the bandwidth required and the distance between the two connected points. In North America, service providers use the T carrier system to define the digital transmission capacity. Uh, and so, as I said, T1 is 1.544 megabits. So dial up. Yeah. So dial up access may be required, but no other WAN technology is available. For example, a remote location could use modems and analog telephone lines to provide low capacity and dedicated switch connections. Traditional local loop local loops which use copper cabling transport binary computer data through the voice telephone network using a modem. They modulate the binary data into an analog signal at the source and of course the other end of the link has to demodulate it back into a binary signal at the destination. Physical characteristics of local loop and it's and it's connected to the PSDN limit uh, is actually 56 kilobits a second if anyone remembers those modems. But actually, practically, through any exchange, you really didn't get over 53Ks anyway. Thankfully, it's a dark age technology. Um, ISDN, as I said, was developed to be a replacement for the PSTN. Um, and so it changes the internal connections for PSTN from carrying analog signals to time division multiplex digital signals. So it allows two or more signals or bit streams to be transferred as subchannels in one communication channel. Um, the ISDN connection may require a terminal adapter, which is a device used to connect uh, basic rate interface or connections to a router. So basically, 
a terminal adapter was sort of like the modem. It was the way that you connected to it. Um, BRI, basic rate interface, was where you had those two circuits I was talking about. So your, your home or small business solution. You could actually also get PRI, which was primary rate interface. And again, that basically was T1 or E1. And so you had, uh, yeah, 1.544 or 2 megabits per second. Um, and so BRI was, uh, yeah, 264K channels, while PRI was either uh, 23 or 30 from memory uh, of those 64K channels. Um, and so, of course, the Americans with T1 had 1544, and so it was the 23B channels, and uh, and I think it was 30 channels on the on the uh, E1 version of it. Each BRI and PRI also have another channel called the D channel or Delta channel, and that was actually for control signals. Um, and so that was your control uh, and call setup and the likes. Uh, it was 16K on BRI, it was 64K on uh, PRI. And so it was very, really good solution in that you could have a PRI connection at your main office and you could have BRIs in all your branch offices and so you could connect them in that way. Um, but as I said, ISDN never really took off big. Did anyone live at Mawson Lakes back in the when it first started off, every house apparently got ISDN. That was one of the trendy things they did. Um, but anyway, that was the technology solution for that. And a lot of people hated it. But anyway, um, it's not popular these days. We actually, we actually used to do labs for ISDN on older versions of uh, CCNA. But yeah, it's less important these days. And so we just talk about it a bit but not a lot. Okay, so Frame Relay, as I said, is a non-broadcast multi-access network. So if you remember from OSPF, we did talk about Frame Relay, frame, frame relay as being MBMA, and of course it treated it differently. It actually had the DR, BDR on that network. Um, so you could actually get data rates up to about four megabits per second for per circuit depending on the supplier. Um, a single router can be used to connect multiple sites using PVCs, which is your uh, permanent virtual circuits, and you can carry both data and voice over it. An edge router only requires a single interface, even when multiple virtual circuits are used. And so it creates PVCs, which are uniquely identified by data link layer connection identifier. There we go, DLC. The PVCs and DLCs ensure bi-directional communication between one DTE device and another. So basically, again, uh, you only had to have one local loop connection from each site to the telco. Uh, in your main site, you just needed to have a higher bandwidth on that one if all your circuits went from branch offices to your uh, main office. And you could have, a, of course, lower bandwidth local loops on your, all your branch offices. And so, you know, your main office would have a virtual circuit for each branch office, basically. So it did work well, but yeah, I'm gonna say the, the speeds you get out of it are pretty much trivial compared to what we expect these days. And yeah, broadband is just so common these days that most people use that as a solution. Okay, so as I said, ATM um, was a solution that was used by the telcos. Uh, and as I also said, they use cells, not packets or frames. It's a different terminology because they're organized differently. And so a five byte header, 48 byte payload. And that was the beauty of it, everything being the same size, the, the automated ASICs could switch that like lightning. And so that was the good thing about them. The bad thing is, of course, is when you're moving data, you have to chop them up into multiple, many, uh, cells. Um, that's us. 
that second last paragraph there, typically ATM needs almost 20% greater bandwidth than frame relay to gain the same volume in network traffic because of that extra overhead. You know, five bytes for every 45, 48 bytes of uh, payload, it, the ratio is not great. Um, so Ethernet WANs becoming more and more popular. Um, and so, of course, over fiber optic cables, so you get much longer runs out of it. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Ethernet over, yeah, uh, Ethernet WANs are certainly a solution. And so, yeah, they, uh, the original maximum cable length for Ethernet was one kilometer. With fiber optic cable, the maximum length is 5Ks uh, or 70Ks if you use the right standards. Uh, service providers now offer Ethernet WAN service using fiber optic cabling, which provides several benefits, reduce expenses and administration, easy integration with existing networks and enhance business productivity. Uh, Ethernet WANs are commonly being used to replace frame relay and ATM WAN links. And so, uh, so of course, Ethernet's wonderful, but of course there's no authentication solution, is there? So if you've heard of triple PoE, that's basically point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet. And so, of course, triple P actually has authentication built in. And yes, we do have a chapter on P triple P. I think it's next week. So uh, we will actually be looking at the authentication system there. And so in reinventing the wheel, uh, building in an, uh, an authentication system with Ethernet, I went, nah, we've already got one. So they sort of plugged them together and away they roll. Now, MPLS is your multi-protocol label switching, is a multi-protocol uh, high-performance WAN technology that directs data from one router to the next. Normally, that's, again, internal to your, uh, your uh, providers. And so uh, MPLS is based on short path labels rather than using IP network addresses. So it's called multi-protocol since it has the ability to carry any payload doesn't have to be IPv4, can be anything. It uses labels which tell the router what to do with a packet. Notice in the figure to the left that different sites can connect to MPLS Cloud using different access technologies. So they're using T1, Metro Ethernet, Frame Relay, you name it. MPLS can support a wide range of WAN technologies. And so, yeah, the service providers do uh, like that a lot. So VSAT, of course, is the satellite uh, solution. Uh, so all private WAN technologies discussed so far use either copper or fiber optic. Um, but of course, that's not always a solution. And so satellite communications is at least accessible in remote locations. So very small aperture terminal is a solution that creates a private WAN using satellite communications. And so you have a small satellite dish used to create a private WAN that provides connectivity to remote locations. The satellite is in geosynchronous orbit up in space there, and the signals travel approximately 35,000 kilometers to the satellite and back. So that's a fair distance. So yeah, the downside of all satellite communications is latency. It takes time for the signal to move there. So DSL, which of course stands for Digital Subscriber Line, um, uses existing twisted pair cables and it enables you to get, of course, much higher bandwidth than was previously possible. So a DSL modem is required, which converts an Ethernet signal from a user device to a DSL signal, which is transmitted to the central office. Um, multiple DSL subscriber lines are multiplexed into a uh, single high capacity DSLAM, so DSL uh, multiplexer basically. Um, and so DSL is a popular choice for IT departments to support home networkers. The subscriber must first connect to an ISP and then the IP connection is made through the internet to your enterprise. Of course, a VPN is a solution there. Cable, who lives on a cable solution? The NBN's doing that. No one? Okay. My son, my son's got a cable solution for NBN. Um
So, network access is available from cable television providers. Of course, it's a bit different here in Australia. It's been taken over by the NBN. Um, using coax cable, which allows for greater bandwidth than the conventional uh, telephone local loop. Cable modems provide an always-on connection and a, a simple installation. The subscriber can connects a computer or a WAN, sorry, LAN router to the cable modem, which translates digital signals into broadband frequencies used for transmitting on a cable network. Uh, the cable modem termination system, which is com component located at the local cable TV office head end, sends and receives digital cable modem signals on the network and is necessary to provide inter pardon, internet services to subscribers. Now, basically, uh, we have whoever it might be working, the teleworker is labelled there, but you know, just someone at their home. They have a router which then hooks into the cable modem, which then of course goes over the cable. Now of course, um, um, cable using the coax, uh, basically the shorter the coax run the better, because uh, it's copper to start with, but also everyone who's connected into that, into that coax shares the bandwidth. And so uh, um, <clears throat> it will then change over to fibre at some point for the trip back to the central office, basically. Um, and then from there, of course, it goes through this CMTS uh, to be disconnect, uh, split from the cable network and then going onto the internet. Wireless. Um, so, until recently, one limitation of wireless access has been the need to be within local transmission range, so about 100 feet or so of a wireless router for a wireless modem. The following new developments have come. So there's municipal Wi-Fi, and so, yes, some councils set up Wi-Fi around their cities, um, and so you often get it for free. Or, of course, there's also a WiMAX, which is a fixed wireless solution, um, and so that is actually another part of the NBN plan for semi-remote uh, subscribers, and so basically, uh, from there, you can hook your house up via an antenna on the roof, basically, to to uh, an antenna that's placed, hopefully, within uh, line of sight. I did actually have WiMAX at my house. That was what the weight was when I was using the modem, was getting the WiMAX set up. Uh, it worked quite well. Until a tree grew between my house and the antenna, and that was a bit of a bummer. But luckily, it only cut off my signal about a month before NBN came to my area. So I used 4G for a little while until the NBN came. So that was uh, all right. So, but yeah, I was I was able to get more than 40 megabits a second out of the WiMAX. So that worked nicely for me. Um, of course, again, because it's wireless, it's shared. So um, yeah, downloading at 2 a.m. was probably a lot better than at 8 p.m. Um, but anyway. So WiMAX uses a, ne a network of WiMAX towers that are similar to cell phone towers. Uh, you must be within 30 miles of the tower. And of course, there's also satellite, which is wireless as well. We did talk about VSAT, but there are other solutions as well. Um, and of course, NBN has that for the most remote people. Of course, I, I knew a guy who lived actually up Montacute Way, and he had to use satellite because it's too hilly for WiMAX because it's a line of sight. And so, yeah, he had to use satellite. Um, okay, and of course, I think this is pretty much the last solution, uh, is your cellular networks. So 3G, 4G, 5G's slowly being rolled out now. Um, and so basically... Um, Again, you can use the cellular network. Um, it does work, and they are getting faster all the time, but normally it's going to cost you more. Um, you know, there's not too many plans where you've got unlimited data on 3, 4, or 5G. Um, and so LTE is just another name for a different technology of 4G. 
3G, to actually claim that to be 3G, you actually needed to have a certain type of service. 4G is just faster than 3G. Um, and so increasingly cellular service is another wireless LAN, WAN technology used to connect users in remote locations. Phones, tablet computers, laptops, even some routers can communicate uh, using cellular. These devices use radio waves to communicate through a nearby mobile tower. The device is a small radio antenna and the provider has much larger antennas sitting on the top of the tower somewhere within uh, miles of the phone. And so of course VPN is a way to get your public internet connections to then become private. Um, and so of course that uses encryption. Um, instead of using a dedicated layer two connection or like a lease line, you can actually use your DSL or whatever internet connection and uh, make it private using VPN. So that is certainly a good solution and a commonly used solution these days. Um, and so it saves you money, gives security, it's scalable and it's compatible with your broadband uh, technologies. And so the two major types of VPNs are site to site where you have router on the main office, router in the branch office and the, they encrypt the communication between the two sites. The other one is a remote access one, which is your small office, home office, traveling salesman alike would connect to a VPN server and then they can get to your site securely. So basically, how do you choose a WAN link? And so you've got to ask yourself quite a few questions. And so what is the purpose of the WAN? And so yeah, so is it site to site or is it from home to a uh, homes to your site? You've got to think about those solutions. What's the ge geography involved? So how far is it? And then what kind of traffic do you want to get through it? And so there, these are all questions you need to ask. And from there, that's when you actually can make an intelligent answer to that question or questions. Should it be private or public? Um, for public, you know, VPN is an option that you can consider. And so, of course, dollars are also an issue that you've got to consider. All right, we've just about finished, just on time. So we'll ex we've looked at the WAN technologies available and we look at how they satisfy business requirements as well. There's the logo. All right. So there is a recommended activity for chapter one. Um, but from memory, I think it's just a bit of a research one. So um, just, uh, so yeah, uh, that's about it. There's not a lot, not no, nowhere near as many labs for CCNA4 as there were for the previous ones. Um, as you can see, chapters two, three, and two, three, four, and five are the ones that have the most labs in them. Um, and so, yeah. So we'll certainly look at those a little later.